So next we have uh, Kevin Belouz, who will be speaking to us from Belouz Farm. So after completing a Bachelor of Science in Plant Biology at Guelph as a President Scholar, um, Kevin worked in Alberta in England for a greenhouse and horticultural company before settling down on the family farm in Thunder Bay in 2001. So there they produce a wide variety um, of sustainably produced vegetables and they also operate a greenhouse and a small retail store which is called Superior Seasons. And um, about half or 80% of their product is sold directly to the public on farm and the remainder is sold, um, sold through wholesale avenues such as restaurants, local grocers and distributors. And Kevin's partner in business and life is Jody Belouz, and they have two children. And I will let Kevin talk to us now about all of his experiences um, setting the right prices for the right market. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. And here's a, a cute picture from a few years ago of our family. So I'm a, a third generation owner here on Belouz Farms. And um, my parents uh, over the farm back in the early 70s. And grandparents started in 1946 on this land, it's only 100 acres. We do actually market through all four, four of these channels on farm, or CSA, I would call that as well. We don't have a, a traditional CSA on our farm, but some of you would be familiar with that. Uh, farmers markets. Uh, we do wholesale selling to restaurants or small volume customers. We also have some large volume wholesale customers or preferred customers. And we do some resellers, so grocery or, or distributors as well. And then we also sell online through a uh, hub that we have as well, and the two are there. So that basically me uh, results in us having four main price levels, uh, four to five, I say. So on farm, um, you can see where, where retail is, and retail is, I list as number one because obviously it's our most important. You can see we've got three different channels there that we get retail prices at, which is critical for us. Um, and then um, we have a, a, what we call a restaurant-based price level, um, a wholesale volume price level, and then a wholesale resale price level. I think it's really important when you're thinking about pricing to think about your brand. And often we have these wholesalers who like to uh, trample on top of our brand here. Um, and we really want to do whatever we can to, to remove them from doing that. And I think it's common that we're, our, our farm brand and, and local food has been damaged over the years. Um, and by activities like people um, mis misadvertising the use of local food, maybe, you know, restaurants right now love to say they're using local food, but when you really drill down and look at their gross percentage of their sales that are, are in local food, it's quite small. So they're kind of taking advantage of us that way. And same it, it is true in other areas. So it's important to make sure that if people are advertising that they're using local food, um, that we're sort of following up on that. And I consider that to be protecting our brand. Well, it's not our brand, say, as well, Loose Farms or... Um, your own your own business. Um, the local food uh, brand is, is something that we need to protect as much as we can and, and do as a, as a team together to help protect that. So as nice as it is sometimes to have our name on a, on a menu, um, I think it's important that there are people are using that um, honestly, otherwise we're, we're doing a little bit of damage there to the brand. All right, so the first thing um, we'll talk about is retail pricing. And retail is, um, you know, as farmers, is something that we have the advantage of, of experience in food in it. And um, so it's a huge advantage over, say, other retailers that are sort of similar or grocery stores or something. Um, obviously, uh, setting prices is, um, is cost-based. So people don't just pay um, uh, based on a... Um, at the sign of the cost, right? There's a there's a perceived value that can be attached to a product and you can include that in the pricing. And so the experience that we can give as a farmer or talking to people is uh, is value that we can add to a product. And so pricing is really um, really part art and part science. So you need to remember that when you're doing your pricing for sure. And I think it's important for us to regain that. I, know I just talked about the branding, but the art of pricing for, for farmers is important as well because we've kind of lost control of pricing of food in, in the marketplace where people are spending uh, uh, less and less almost every year as a percentage of their income towards their food. So I think it's important for us to help our businesses survive and do better to, to regain some of that. And there's a report, for example, that the USDA did, um, a couple of people called Fitchler and Stewart, that you, you want to look them up, but that, you know, the average uh, vegetable price decreased 1% per year from 1980 to 2006 and when adjusted for inflation. So 
while every other industry is able to get more money uh, after a year, food prices have, have actually gone down. So we need to sort of correct that where we can. Um, the other quick thing I just wanted to say about the farm experience, sorry, I kind of jumped ahead on the slides here a bit, but is that um, people people are willing to pay for experience. And so even we do a lot of pick your own at our farm. And if you're involved with that, um, um, there, you, know, you need to make sure you're getting properly compensated for that. And the tradition always was that pick your own was cheaper than, say, something fresh picked. But I know some farms are actually charging more now to have people come to pick on the farm because of this experience idea. And uh, there is some justification for that just in the cost of insurance, et cetera, and all these things that you need to do to have people on your farm. Okay, so that's uh, important to remember that as well. Okay, so the last thing I'd say about pricing and, and perceived value, I guess, is also that uh, we have a kind of a rule on our farm with uh, finding what the, the correct retail pricing is. Jessica gave a bunch of great tips to research on that, but one of the rules we like to have is that um, if no one is complaining about our price, it probably means we're too low. So it's kind of good to have, although you hate to hear complaints, uh, I sort of can engage that as a, as a sign that you maybe hit, hit that right sweet spot with getting the odd complaint. Because obviously then, um, you know, you've got it maybe in a good spot where you're able to get it, to get a good dollar for what you're, um, the work you're putting in, but also, you know, not charging too much. So it's kind of another tool to use in, in analyzing that. All right, so this big complicated spreadsheet, where I'm not going to go through it in all detail. These are uh, somewhat real numbers from our farm, um, but it's the kind of the way that we're uh, tool we're using here to keep track of different prices. And so you can see across the top here, we've got five different uh, or four different products unit size to sell our market our product in. Um, hourly wage costs, so that's a, a critical component in fruit and vegetable production. Um, uh, our, our biggest cost really is the, the manual labor that goes into harvesting, packing, product to get to market. So it's a, that's a huge factor in, in determining your cost uh, of production. Um, and remember, I think it was mentioned already, but if, you, you know, if you're paying someone um, $12 an hour, for example, um, that's not their real cost to you as uh, an employee because of all those other factors, and, um, including the paid breaks or or uh, the extra CPP, et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, a good rule of thumb I've heard is generally if you take the wage and add um, times it by 1.25, um, that will give you a, a realistic kind of look at what the actual cost of that employee is to you per hour. So we've kind of looked at um, our pounds harvested um, per hour, or different things done per hour. Remember when you're including these things, you need to think about um, things like wastage or grade out that's going to happen. If it's a storage vegetable, how much of that that they picked in that hour are you actually going to be able to end up selling at the end of the, the period? Um, so including some of that is important. Um, down this column again here, we're looking at some of the uh, things that maybe some are you think are insignificant, but are you know you need to keep track of um, you know your bag costs, um, your box costs if you're boxing things, uh, label costs for example if you're labeling each bag, um, and some of those things add up over time. Um, particularly boxing costs uh, is something that you may lose track of. If you're used to going to a farmer's market or selling it yourself, you're getting those boxes back. But as soon as you start doing wholesale, maybe to restaurants or to uh, you know other uh, distributors and grocers, they're maybe keeping those boxes. You're not getting them back all of a sudden. So the cost of that box becomes significant. Um, you know, you cost your box here. We've got this broken out in 10 pound carrots. Um, so the box is is $1.80, I think, or something that's close. So we could fit four bags in a box. So then our actual cost of the box is broken down how many bags we actually fit in that box. So you can figure that out as well. This is a big one. You know, your equipment costs, um, we try and include a little bit of that when I'm thinking of the cost. But this is a fixed cost, and, and we just could talk about the difference uh, of that. So um, the amount... Uh, that that works out to per pound obviously is totally based on the year you have and the quality of the crop and how many pounds you're able to pick. So um, that can be um, uh, can really fluctuate hugely. This year, for example, we've had really poor crop of carrots. So our equipment, if we're trying to amortize that into this one year, the the portion this year is going to cover of that is is, is relatively small. So that cost goes up significantly. So then we just try and add them all up here and get um, um, some idea of what we're going to sell at wholesale um, and what our margin might be uh, from those products for wholesale. So you can see some examples of that. 
And obviously this is where the art of, 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 Setting prices comes in. You need to know what you can sell it for. Some products you're going to make a lot more margin on, maybe, or can make more margin on, and others will be a lot less. Um, in retail selling here, I've also included, I separate out marketing costs and put it down here with my retail because that's a cost that is not directly associated with, with wholesale selling, all, uh, although you, you know, there's some crossover there. Uh, I, so I'd like to put it down here so it's more directly uh, reflected in the cost of selling at retail. So I uh, make sure I add that in into that spot so we have a better idea of what our actual margins are than at retail. And this rule of 45 down at the bottom here is, is something that um, David Kohlmeyer, some of you may have heard of him, he used to, um, used to run a business uh, down in Southern Ontario there uh, doing lots of greens, Cookstown Greens was the name of the business, but he's a consultant now. And he has this rule of 45 that he uses. And he says, um, basically, um, if you calculate the number of units you can harvest, clean and bag per hour per person, and then you uh, divide that into 45. Um, that gives you the um, price that you need to sell per unit roughly to make more. And so you can look that up online. It's got a little more information about it. He came up with the 45 comes from this idea that if your average employee is, is paid $15 an hour and 30% of his your average costs are going to be uh, in that harvesting and cleaning bagging section, if you multiply that by three, that would cover your total costs for your business then. So that's where that 45 number comes from. And it is, um, I found it to be uh, hit and miss in our business, but I've sort of tried to apply it to a lot of our different spots. And some things, um, it works better than others. In this case, you can see applied here, it more closely actually resembles our, our cost of production for these specific root crop items than anything that we could, if we sold at these prices, we would not be making any money. So it's um, if you're going to use that as a way to sort of just start uh, getting a gauge on some pricing, I think it works much more accurately if you're a smaller business, if you have very little uh, overhead and depreciation costs that you need to be considering, and if you're doing a lot of the picking and work yourself. I think this 45 rule is something that's really could be really handy to help give you an idea of, of where to price things at. Um, and so it's something to start with. And I certainly, I guess just from my experience, I wouldn't go any lower than what the number you get from that. Uh, I would always try and put that up a little bit. It gives you a little more room. And that's kind of another good rule for pricing, I think, is you always, uh, where possible, want to start high. It's really hard to raise prices. It's a lot easier to lower them. So um, if you're unsure of a price point, um, go a little higher on the high side, and then just from there, it gives you the opportunity to do discounts, uh, you know, promotions, uh, specials, and other things. So it's a, it's a really good trick to help, um, help you set pricing. Um, this is a little few pictures just from our farm store on our farm. So as I mentioned, pick your own and selling on the farm is a big part of this uh, for our business because we get to get those retail margins there. So it gives us the opportunity to sell a lot there. Um, I don't know if you were able to read the uh, signs in the back there. People who love bees are always the best people. And to keep your friends close and keep your farmers close. And we do have a farm store at our farm. Um, we've been doing it, you know, for a long time as well. Um, I guess since probably before 2000, even, uh, you know, my mom's been making jams and jellies and, um, other things like that. And we've been adding more and more local products into that. And recently also some products from Southern Ontario that we sell more as well. And so we're into basically a little bit of a grocery type business there where we're reselling products. So we have the experience of setting those prices, but I'll talk more about that later. And then activities, uh, you know, farm activities, there's a, uh, an example of something that there's there's no science involved in pricing. You just can charge as much as you think people are willing to pay for that experience. Um, and it's a lot, uh, people are a lot uh, more willing to part with money to do a, a wagon ride for $5, for example, that lasts 30 minutes than they are to uh, buy a dozen sweet corn or something for that same price, despite the fact that it would nourish them for a week. So activities are, are another example where you can, uh, on to the farmer's market. So that's another channel, again, that we uh, utilize to get retail margin and retail prices. Um, obviously, it's relatively inexpensive to get started at a farmer's market. Um, but um, I think it's it, you really have to pay attention to, um, to the cost of being there and, and some of the other costs associated with farmer's market to make sure you're still making the money you think you are. And... Um, when you start at a farmer's market, everybody loves the new new market vendor. So customers are really appreciate that, especially if you um, happen to be young or have two kids working for you or something like that. 
Um, but remember in year two or three, that's going to change and there'll be someone else who's the new face. So you've got to be ready for that and make sure you've got your pricing set to coordinate with that. Um, it could be a little fickle. Um, so it's really important to know that your market fees um, and, and base them as a percentage. So for example, you know, 35 or $50 for a table at a market sounds insignificant, but if you're only selling 350 or $500 worth of product, then all of a sudden that's, um, you know, 10% of your gross sales and maybe 25 or 30% of your uh, net sales. So um, it becomes a very significant factor quickly. And the other thing that can happen at farmer's markets, I think, is the, uh, the farmer's math application that the Jessica's doing where you're, you know, you're going to town anyways to get other stuff or, um, you know, the, the vehicle, you know, just because it wasn't full, it uh, doesn't mean it wasn't the use of the vehicle. Um, so make sure you're calculating those costs in there as well. And there's a great um, spreadsheet called Farm to School Distribution Template uh, by someone called Holtum. And you can look them up if you want. They're letting me know I can give you the info. And they basically have a great uh, template there to calculate all those vehicle costs that are associated with taking product to market, whether it's a farmer's market or wholesale or to schools or whatever. So um, it's really useful to calculate those costs into your pro into your into your production. Um, and farmers markets, um, so at all of our retail channels, um, we have the same retail pricing. Uh, so we like the transparency in that. So if a if a you know a dozen corn is seven dollars at the farm, it's seven dollars at the farmers market, seven dollars on our online store. And there obviously are different costs associated with each of the, those channels, but we try and set things knowing that and. Uh, we think that works well in terms of uh, uh, encouraging customers to use any of those channels and to, to purchase our product from. So it's something to think about, I think, too, when you're setting your prices is um, consider all your channels and maybe make sure you're setting it so that you could use something uh, like that in, in all your channels. It also really helps your staff and your sanity to have the same price everywhere so people don't have to switch back and forth and try to remember different prices or things like that. Um, wholesale in our wholesale market, um, so we've got a bunch of different price levels there, which we'll talk a little bit more in a second. But it's wholesale gets trickier the you know the the further up that channel you're going. So if you're if you're doing just restaurants, for example, that's a little little bit less sophisticated than if you are doing um, uh, grocers or, or other distributors. So you know, be atten pay attention to that. Make sure you really uh, want to be in that channel if you're going to be doing it at the volume and the consistency that they, they generally require. Restaurants are a real challenge um, to deal with sometimes, so you need to be careful. Make sure you're charging enough for them. I think, uh, make and that that you're going to be um, be covered for the work that has to go into that, and and whether or not they actually end up paying you, whether they have time. So that can be a, a big deal for sure. And then um, with all the other channels as well, you generally are getting less margin. So you've got to be organized well enough that you've got um, all your logistics and, and those pieces in, in a row so that you're getting properly compensated for what you do with those, that product. Um, so when we got to talk about the grocery chains, I'll maybe get to this next slide right now here. So um, at our wholesale levels, we're generally working backwards from our retail price. So we've set that retail price using some of those tools Jessica listed and and our own intelligence and, and, and things. And then we're going backwards off of that um, to set our other price levels. So restaurants are getting about 10 to 15% off of that. Wholesale volume customers would get 20 to 25%. Um, and wholesale resale customers would get 30 or a little bit more sometimes. And that's roughly um, the way our, our way it works. The art part of it all comes in here. Obviously, there's different customers that you have to uh, be fully you know, aware of the individuality of those customers. So some restaurants may get, uh, may not get quite as much of a discount sometimes because they don't pay on time or um, have very small orders and um, expect you to deliver them you know, or something. So you've got to be sort of flexible and, and know that the costs associated with some of those things. And so we're generally giving, if you start at the bottom there, we're generally giving 30% uh, off to uh, grocers or res resellers. Um, and then that, you know, just as an example, if it was our dollar, we're selling something at retail, that's what the, uh, the other uh, different price levels would be and what people are paying. And then the point of that, I guess, in the end of the day is that, um, by giving this wholesaler reseller, uh, 30% off of our retail, it then means they could theoretically make 30% margin if they want to sell at that same price, uh, that we're selling. And we think that's important. In, uh, again, it, it gives that transparency in the market. So it makes sense to the customer that um, 
you know, the price would be X because uh, they, they're seeing that price everywhere, essentially. And what you'll find probably is, though, that grocers and some of these people will want more than 30% margin. So they're going to be slightly above that anyways. Um, and so that kind of makes sense as well from our perspective in that then we are, are they buy direct from us. They're getting a slightly better price than if they're buying from the grocer. And that makes sense to people because obviously the grocer had to mark it up to some level. So it kind of uh, provides a logical transparency there, which is important, I think, for customers across all the channels. And um, that said, um, you know, here's well, here's the other corresponding margins that they get. So if we have a distributor who's also, say, selling to restaurants, um, using this formula and keeping to this as much as possible, they can make still make 23% margins by selling to the same price as a restaurant. And we partially do this as well in, in cases like this to, to be respectful to our distributors. So if we have a distributor who wants to sell to restaurants, um, it's they're not going to be able to do that if we're undercutting them, say, when we go to restaurants and sell significantly lower than they're able to to make a, a fair profit. So um, by keeping these sort of a, as much consistent as we can, it allows um, a partner that we have as a distributor maybe to also serve restaurants. And again, the transparency in the system uh, from the restaurant's perspective, it looks good for, for everyone and is hopefully going to encourage sales overall. So we find that to be really valuable, I think. Um, Oh, yes, I wanted to make a comment about the groceries and, and charging uh, too much. So, you know, they some groceries want 50% margin. And uh, to me, that is um, is not fair. I mean, maybe if you had a product where there's a lot of waste and you're not servicing them well and there's, you know, you're, you're not being a good supplier, then I can see they could justify that. But I, I don't think any of us would want to do that. So we're trying to be good suppliers. We're local. We're probably making more deliveries than they normally get or at least make a delivery at the drop of a hat, which they can't always get. So to me, um, 30% is enough for them and in that range. And, and, and it also, I don't want them overcharging too much for my product. If the customer's first experience with a Belize Farms carrot is from a store that's charging 50% margin and, and doubling the cost or the price of that product, that may have a negative effect on my ability to sell carrots in other places because the perception in the market then is that they're really expensive all the time. And it takes, maybe it's hard to break that uh, idea in people's minds. So we try and watch for that as well when we're, we're dealing with um, any resellers to make sure that the prices are roughly where they want them. So yeah, we have a few, few, few tools to try and convince them not to do that. And, and, and basically just advertising our services and trying to serve them really well and, and make them understand that there's no waste and loss and what they're going to have. And some of those things really give us some, some control over that. The uh, last thing maybe there I'd say about wholesale pricing and getting them is people will give you information um, about wholesale prices if you ask. Uh, whether you can trust that always or not is is questionable. So make sure you do you ask as many people as you can to get a representative uh, sample. And the Impohort uh, website um, that Jessica listed is is a rough gauge as well. I have found that that um, site is generally the prices on there are are higher than people are actually paying even up here in Thunder Bay after getting it shipped here. So I suspect that the way that information is collected, um, um, the, the distributors who are submitting that information are giving a kind of a highball number just to try and keep prices up. And then when they actually deal with their, their customers at the food terminal, they're giving them discounts and bargains and there's all kinds of lower stuff out there for that. So just a word of warning about the Fulhort site. I would say it's you know maybe in the ballpark, but um, certainly is not low. Low price anyways. All right. And the last thing I was going to talk about uh, is our last channel we had mentioned, which was um, um, our online channel. And we started in 2010, we started a food hub with two other farms uh, with the idea being that online was the, the latest, greatest thing and was going to give us a new channel to sell, sell retail um, to, to consumers at and hopefully get a larger uh, piece of the, the pie and, and steal a bit of the grocer's business. Um, and and it has worked to some extent, although it's been a very slow and steady process, I'd have to say. Um, and the way we run it is sort of like all the other hubs is, um, so we take 5%. Uh, of any, any producer who wants to manage their own inventory and own pricing, so we don't have to buy inventory from them, um, we'll take 5% of any of their wholesale order sales and 10% of any retail. And for that, we do the correlating and delivery and kind of bring it all together in one package for the customers. 
Um, so that's the way we run it. And obviously, it also works as a uh, channel for us to sell our own products on Balloon Farms. Um, so that's, um, you know, the main reason we've been able to run it as well is that we can subsidize it from our own resources for sure. And the great thing about the online systems and or co-ops or other options that are out there is that these systems tend to have a lot of features to help you organize your orders. The downside of that is if someone or you enter the wrong price in that system, then everyone sees it right away as well. So it's uh, it's only as good as the, um, the person using it, of course, like all computer things. Uh, and so you've got to keep a really close eye on that because there's potential problems from there. Of course, um, we are starting to bring more inventory in and buy, buy outright inventory now to use for this site, um, which has really sort of helped it take off a bit more. Uh, having more selection for people, obviously, is I think is the key there. And so we're getting into more of that. And then that means, like our farm store here, we're, we're acting essentially as a grocer or retailer in a lot bigger ways. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit of that about how we price for that in the last few minutes here. Um, and so, yeah, the sites have all kinds of features, of course, and what it allows us to do is, um, you know, we give, we give a lot of information about products and attributes and different features. Uh, people can place reviews. But then, you know, you can also have these prices and there's sort of drop down menu, so we can have different, different sizes there, uh, case sizes. And then we can also have all of our different four price levels built into this system. So if a customer's a restaurant signs in, they only see the restaurant pricing. So it's a really nice uh, seamless way to make that happen and keep track of all that for everyone, um, which is, which is very useful. We find very useful. Um, and um, yeah, and it's, everything has to be really right on there, of course. Um, the other nice thing about this system is restaurants and some of those places, institutions are used to, hot sheets or these lists of things that would come out traditionally over the fax machine but nowadays um, obviously more digital so this this site allows us to do that and get, they can either click a link to get their hot sheet what's available to them or see their specific prices or we can send that to them and so when we're buying product um, in to resell and taking in that inventory um, some of the key things we're thinking of here are um, shipping, obviously. So is there what is the cost of bringing that product in? Right now, uh, we generally pay about 30 cents a pound to say to bring something up from Toronto. Um, and so freight costs are a big, big deal. Um, and they could be significantly, uh, they can fluctuate significantly with fuel costs, et cetera. So you've got to watch that. We try and factor in then the handling and storage of that. If you're unpacking a truck, repacking, et cetera. Um, there's costs associated with that that you need to factor into each product. Um, bagging and label, or the actual bag and label. Um, and so how, how do you keep track of that? And then you need to decide what margins you're going to put on product after that. So it's important to get all those costs in first um, and add those into the cost of your actual product and then apply your margin to all those costs um, in that system in order to be making sure you're going to cover all those costs appropriately, of course. Um, so we tend to try and get a close to 35% margin at retail on those products when we're handling that. And the main issue is the variables. Uh, the reason we need more uh, margin on those than we would otherwise is that it's that inventory that you're handling and the variable that happens there with loss, et cetera. So um, basically the way to think of it is, is uh, if you have a 35% margin on something, if you don't sell 35% of that product for some reason, uh, either do it go bad or it just doesn't sell, you're still out that money and you're, you're your loss becomes, or your profit becomes zero, uh, right? Up, very quickly there, so um, you've got to really watch that, and so that's why you need sort of enough margin in there on average to to, to make those things work. Um, pricing online and at retail, um, we do use a few of the same tricks as other people. You know, there's that the psychological issues of whether something is two ninety nine or three dollars. Um, generally speaking, we try and always round things off better. We feel that's more uh, farmy, more farmer's markety, not doing that, you know, that thing uh, of, of the psychological barriers. But uh, online, you do kind of have the ability to do that a bit. So we sometimes use that, particularly for more expensive items, because you maybe it's more valuable at that point to make something, you know, twenty nine ninety nine instead of 30, um, for example. And um, so that's something to think about as well when you're setting your retail pricing. Uh, package sizing is the other thing, and especially you know in this when you have some inventory like this and you're repacking things and um, you're trying to hit specific price points maybe. So trying to keep an item under five dollars, again, don't do a pound, do a half pound, and then you can maybe uh, put the margin up a little bit 
Uh, even though that's a lot more um, repacking, it, it allows you maybe to hit a, a better margin and therefore be more profitable in the long run. So package sizes is another important thing to consider when you're looking at prices and you end up with, with those price points. I can't finish without you know some beautiful shots here of my daughter who's now 15. And there's a little info on how to get a hold of me if you have any questions at all. 